Hey there, and welcome to The Nonprofit Show. We are so glad to have you here. Today is a mun yay, as I like to refer to it, because Friday gets all the fun, and we really need to give some fun to Monday as well. But I'm thrilled to have with us here today, Patrick Ganim. I've been practicing this last name. Patrick Ganim joins us, CEO and founder of Talent Sync. He's here to talk about what about the money and hiring staff on a tight budget? I'm sure many of you across the nation can resonate with that because as a nonprofit, we often are working on very tight budgets. But before we jump into conversation with you, Patrick, we want to remind our viewers and our listeners who we are if we have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet. Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. If you're thinking, where is she? I can't see her. Don't worry. She's taken the day off. She'll be back here tomorrow. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Julia for creating this beautiful platform of conversation. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. Truly honored to serve as a co-host um, and be here for this conversation. Shout out of immense gratitude goes to these amazing presenting sponsors, which include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these companies, many of them have been with us from the very beginning when we started the show in March of 2020 helped us to produce over a thousand episodes now. And if you missed any of them or you're just, you know, brand new here to the show, here's where you can find it. Um, go ahead and pull out your smartphone, scan this QR code, and you can download the app on your phone. You can find us still on the broadcast as well as the podcast channel. So don't fret wherever you like to binge watch or binge listen your entertainment. We are right there too. So Patrick, thank you for waiting. I know we had a some housekeeping to get through. But for everyone watching and listening across the nation or the globe, again, today we have with us Patrick Ganim, CEO and founder of Talent Sync. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here today. <laughs> yeah, really thrilled. And I want to give a shout out to Zach Brown, who was the amazing human being to connect us with you, Patrick. Um, both of you in San Antonio. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Patrick, and a little bit about Talent Sync as it relates to our friends in the nonprofit sector before we jump into today's conversation. Sure. Well, well, thanks again for having me today. So my name is Patrick. I own a boutique recruiting firm. It's called Talent Sync. We specialize in helping nonprofits strategically grow both in the San Antonio area and across the United States. How we do that is basically leveraging a couple pieces of technology, uh, as well as um, skilled recruiters. We have people on our staff with 20 years, 15 years experience. I'm the newbie with 10 years of, of experience in this space. And basically we help these nonprofits grow strategically on a budget, right? And so that's the kind of topic of our conversation today. And so we'll kind of dive into kind of what makes our approach unique and how we can help these nonprofits grow. Thank you for that. And yes, check out um, Patrick. I'm assuming you're well, I know you are. I'm not going to assume anymore because I know you and I have been connected on LinkedIn and you're very active on that platform as well. So <laughs> let's do, let's dive right in. What is a nonprofit talent pipeline? What does that look like and what are you seeing? So great question. Uh, so overall, I mean, when you're looking at building a nonprofit pipeline, we need to think about a couple things, right? And so First thing is defining our needs, right? What do we, what does our organization need and how does it relate in with our, our mission and our goals of that organization? And then from there, kind of start with targeted outreach to people, right? Are these, um, you know, what is the best way to, to reach these people? Is it social media? Is it attending nonprofit networking events? Is there a particular event um, that speaks to your organization's mission that would be a great way of connecting to that talent pipeline that you're sinking? The other thing to consider as we're building a nonprofit type uh, talent pool is how do we engage our existing volunteers in our community? Is there a way for us to connect better with them and offer those people opportunities to become a full-time member of the organization? 
Um, and then from there, you know, not only promoting, you know, people from coming externally, but how can we also promote from within too? So offering meaningful opportunities for existing employees to professionally develop and elevate themselves in the organization. That's so key because not only is that, you know, promoting from within and the growth potential from that organization within, it, keeping that talent within, but it also attracts people to join your organization too. If they see that others are being promoted from within, that just makes your company and organization that much more attractive to join in the future. Um, beyond that, you know, building relationships as well is another key thing I thought of when I was kind of putting this together. So building relationships with potential candidates, it can take a while, right? Especially in the nonprofit space, which sometimes the talent pool is, you know, fairly narrow, right? And so, you know, building those connections with the future in mind that, oh, well, hey, I talked to somebody, um, you know, a year ago about that was perfect, but they weren't ready at the time. Um, they might be a good person to think of now type thing. So building those relationships in that nonprofit community can, can really pay off in the long run, um, even if you may not have an opportunity available perfectly for them right now. So keep that in mind. And then, you know, this is something where, where Talent Sync and my organization can kind of come in and help as well. This is kind of utilizing technology. There's a lot of different um, new pieces of technology now that you can leverage to help source and search for the right people to join your organization. That's really where Talent Sync comes in. We basically have a strategic approach to getting talent. We are unlike any other recruiting company that goes out and posts positions. We do not post any positions at all. We go out and strategically reach out to individuals who we feel are a good fit with your organization. And by doing so, we cut down on the hundreds of applicants that typically filter through an applicant tracking system and really narrow down the best people from the start to deliver talent to our clients. So that's what makes our approach a little unique. And so we use technology to do that, to find the best people, but also our network too. Um, to basically get our clients the best talent. So um, so that's kind of a couple of things about thinking about a nonprofit pipeline. Um, beyond that, I had a couple other points um, and this is kind of going to social media and kind of um, how to market your organization. Really, um, Promote your mission is one recommendation I'd say. So, you know, on social media, be sure you clearly communicate your mission and your goals for the organization so that it's clear to potential candidates how your mission aligns with what you're doing on a day to day basis and how that can resonate with people that are in your network um, that may be interested in joining your team full time. So, I hope that helps. Does that answer your question? Great insights. And I love that you bring up the mission. And I want us to talk about that next is, you know, we talk often, Julie and I do about there's 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the United States. So a lot of critical missions, a lot of, you know, missions that so many of us can get behind. So how do we find the people, the right people, right? The right talent who also believe and align and support the mission in which we're seeking that pipeline or that talent to help us as a workforce. Like how do, how do we find that match? Yeah, that's sometimes a challenge, right? To find that match. But there's a couple tips I have that might be able to help a little bit. First okay. is clearly defining that mission, right? And articulating it out through the various social media platforms that your organization uses, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever, but being very clear and precise about that mission and articulating how it relates on the day-to-day -day functions that your organization is doing. So um, that is one key thing because that communicates clearly, you know, this is what we do. This is what we are. This is what we're about. Um, and then when people see that, it, it typically resonates with them. Oh, okay. I know exactly what you're doing. I know exactly. And that aligns with what my own personal mission and goals. As you're interviewing people as you're kind of going through the talent um, pipeline part of it where you're, where you're screening candidates, it can come up kind of organically as you're talking to people, I think, overall. And it really has to do with kind of when, uh, when you're talking to candidates, when they kind of ask questions about the organization, is it is are they bringing up talking about the mission in the first five minutes of the conversation or is it in the last five minutes of the conversation? Are they talking about compensation first or are they talking about compensation last? 
And so those sort of things um, can be a self-selecting way of people showing where their missions and values are uh, from an initial conversation. So whenever I'm talking to candidates, I always keep that in mind um, to see really where their interests lie as um, as we're, we're, we're talking to them. So keep that in mind as you're talking to talent. Um, I got a couple other key points about kind of missions. Um, you know, engage with the community, right? And this is kind of a point I made earlier about basically making sure you're engaged, you know, with the local community that you serve, right? Put on events, put on social media uh, activities uh, and other channels telling them about how your mission relates and impacts the community that you're in. And then leverage that network. Reach out to people in that network that are um, part of that group already. Reach out to previous volunteers, donors, board members, those type of people um, who are already likely aligned with your mission uh, and ask them to be part of, of the organization. And then finally, kind of be transparent. Be transparent about your organization's goals, impacts, and challenges that they may face. Um, this way you can help basically find potential candidates that understand and expect what, what to go into uh, with your organization as they kind of look forward to, to kind of a full-time role potentially. So hopefully does that help a little bit? That's very insightful. I appreciate it. Because what I'm seeing too within this space, Patrick, um, and we shared last week and I forget which philanthropy uh, publication it was, but they were talking about the C-suite exodus and how a lot of the C-suites within the nonprofit sector, uh, those individuals are now leaving to create a consultancy practice, right? I mean, I did this 15 years ago, so I get it. <laughs> I understand the desire to want to do that. So I feel like that opens up a lot of opportunities for our nonprofit sector. Um, you talked earlier, you know, with the pipeline looking within, is this a great opportunity to say, okay, what are we looking at? Because what I'd like to pull up really is succession planning. How do we build that into this conversation when it comes to that pipeline. Um, yeah. And you touched on it because it really is about promoting from within. And I don't think I hear that often enough in our community. It, are, what are yeah. you seeing in regards to all that? I think that's a goal for a lot of nonprofits to attain, right? I think there's probably not a lot not enough emphasis placed on succession planning, especially with C-suite departures, right? And so that oftentimes goes into uh, how much resources we can put into each employee at, in the organization to help prepare them to, to grow and elevate to those higher levels within the organization. So I think that's probably a, one of the challenges, but honestly, I think uh, as we you know, as we keep moving on into the future here, that is the right path to go down, in my opinion, because it's a way to connect uh, and continue the, the mission of the organization rather than bringing in somebody new from outside who may not be involved. It's it's um, going to be a way to, you know, continue kind of the legacy of that team as people kind of leave, uh, unfortunately. So I, I absolutely yeah. agree with you where it's um, it's absolutely critical to kind of think of succession planning as we're continuing to, to help grow these organizations, especially C-suite level individuals. Yeah, exactly. And I think too, um, I, and I am definitely not in your subsector of the market, but I've heard and I've learned over the last four years that a big piece of, of you know, making sure that you have the right talent is to maintain and retain the talent you do have. So what I just oh, learned yeah. from you, Patrick, is also like, how are we building our existing talent base, our pool that we have already on payroll? What are we doing to prepare them for their next you know, position, their next role and responsibility? And I think that's really key. And I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that even kind of dovetails into our next part, which is talking about budget, right? And so um, one of the most, you know, people don't really, it's not really obvious how much it costs to hire someone often. And so, or even less obvious is how much it costs to replace someone after they leave a company, right? And so, you know, the whole hiring process itself is very expensive. You have to time, resource, energy to interview someone, to source someone, all this. It's, it's not easy, right? And so it's, 
from a cost benefit standpoint, it's often a lot more affordable to invest those resources in existing employees, help them grow and mature and move and elevate to the next level of their career within the organization rather than have departures that and attrition that are very costly to to replace those people on a regular basis so from a budget standpoint a thoughtful company should be thinking about investing in their employees rather than thinking about oh okay people have left we're going to hire some more um if we put the resources into high, into you know retaining people, I think we'd have a better outcome. And to your point about succession planning, it would only help elevate, um, you know, as, as we do have key, key leaders in the organization uh, leave, it would only help elevate kind of the, the organizations to, to grow in that sense too. So <laughs> hopefully that helps too. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. So as we as we dive deeper into the growth that accounts for the tight budget, you mentioned a few things, right? Like the cost. I'm also interested in the time. What is the realistic time frame of an open position being filled? And that's not even touching on like the learning curve and ramping up to be a fully like I, I want to say the word functioning, but I know that they're coming in fully functioning from the start, but yeah. learning, you know, their position, learning the culture, the intricacies of the team. Talk to us about resources, both time and money, yeah. if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I will say it really depends on the role, right? You can have junior roles where the ramp up time is fairly quick. You can have more advanced roles and leadership roles where the ramp up time is longer. It really depends. Um, there's also technical roles too. I mean, for example, I'm working with a client where we're helping them build a IT team. They're growing it from 30 people to 65 people right now. And so we're having, you know, hiring these higher level architect positions, but at the same time hiring, you know, customer success people too, which were are more kind of more day-to-day -day operational type people too. So they're gonna have different ramp up times, but they're all gonna start at the same time. So hopefully with with a onboarding where it's clearly defined kind of the, the organization's mission and culture at the start, they should all have a good start together and then kind of from there kind of grow and develop uh, within the organization. I think realistically, you know, 30 to 60 days is when most uh, companies can get ramped up uh, and, and, and get somebody going. You know, sometimes it's sooner, but those are typically more junior positions. And for more strategic C-suite level positions, you know, it's going to take longer to know the intricacies of, of the position and understand, you know, exactly you know, who I need to talk to for this. And, you know, a, a lot of times, I mean, there's, there's, you know, C-suite positions, it takes 90 days at a minimum just to understand the organization and, and everything that entails with that particular role. So uh, to short answer is that it, it depends, but, um, but really, you know, making sure that they have the resources to succeed, I think is the most important part once they join your organization. So having that infrastructure in place and ha having, um, you know, maybe a point person I've seen, uh, for example, example, having uh, people buddy up like a buddy partner when, when you get new hires on board, right? So you have somebody that's been there on the team one or two years, and they kind of partner with this person, welcoming them, welcoming them in, uh, helping get them accustomed to the culture of the organization, and really just kind of being a friend and ally to somebody who's completely new. And so that may be an approach that, that might resonate and work with some organizations, um, and it doesn't really cost too much, right? It's just helping partner up and help other people and that's a good way to kind of use your budget, I guess. Absolutely. I'm curious how all of this, because I've been listening with all of it in mind, but we've got in-person, right? Like our on-site staff, we have completely remote staff, we have hybrid, we have offshore, like how does all of the workforce right now, like what are you seeing when it comes to your company with Talent Sync? In the variety of employment opportunities, as well as locations. I mean, we joked about time zones because I'm in Arizona yeah. and with one, but like, how does all of that play into this conversation, Patrick? I'm really curious. Yeah. And it's, it's a really interesting environment, especially since COVID, right? We've, we've kind of done a full yeah. swing from 
everybody, you know, fully in the office to fully remote during COVID to hybrid now. And then now I've seen in, in my space a lot of a push to have people back in the office, right? And so um, I think it really depends on the organization, but I think there is a big push overall to get people in the office for the same goal of just collaborating with people face to face, which I think is a noble reason. I don't know if it works for every organization, given how we've been hiring across the last three years uh, in a COVID landscape where we've got people in Nebraska working for companies in Austin and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's something where how practical is it for people to come into the office is a question I have. I think if you're building a new team, there is, um, you know, definitely encouragement to have people come to the office if you're hiring locally, uh, right? And so, for example, that client I mentioned where we're building a team, um, an IT team, they only wanted to hire local, right? They only wanted people that could come into the office who are local here to San Antonio, uh, who could be, you know, face to face with their peers, right? And so, um, you know, there's pros and cons to that too, because when you do a, an approach like that, where you're hiring just local, you're limited to the talent pool that's just there in that local vicinity, right? Rather than if you expand it to a remote position, well, you have the entire country to to choose somebody from. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You have pros and cons with every approach. Um, and it really comes down to the leadership and what they value most uh, to kind of the approach and direction they go. Um, I think each has pros and cons. Um, you know, if you're if you're a smaller organization where having a brick and mortar presence um, is a costly um, piece of your budget, well, then maybe a remote staff uh, that can do the same capabilities uh, makes sense, right? If you're an organization that ha already has a lease on something and, you know, you really want to build something local, well, then maybe, you know, fully in the office makes sense. It all depends. <laughs> <laughs> to say. <laughs> it does. And I see it often where it will say like, um, and I, I even know my friends at Bloomerang, they are still, you know, hiring for more rock stars to join their team. And it'll say, you know, based in Indiana, if you are in the local community, you're welcome to work, you know, on site. And there's that, you know, remote option if you don't live near their headquarters. Um, yeah. So there's really a variety that's, that's taking place here. But it's all really fascinating. And I'm really curious to see how it's, you know, going to move us forward because I do think at this time, uh, Patrick, there's there's a lot of things really coming into like merge. Uh, and I don't mean merge as if as in like an acquisition, but merge as if, you know, there it there are conversations about growth in the nonprofit. There are conversations about succession planning. And I am still doing a lot of strategic planning where the CEOs are saying it is time for me to retire, you know, because they've held on so very long, um, well past what they wanted to, you know, to help really just maintain some normalcy over the last four years. So there's a lot going on. Patrick, I am thrilled to have you dive deep into this conversation. It's a conversation I'm going to say, and I'm sure you see this more than I do, it is constantly evolving. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so I don't know how you keep your finger on the pulse. I mean, besides this is your job, this is your career, this is what you do, but it's ever changing. Uh, the landscape of the workforce is changing the landscape. And we could have you on to talk about this, you know, in a separate conversation, like the needs and the advocacy that our employees are doing nowadays during the interview process like that to me is, is all new and I welcome it, but it's just, again, it's an evolution of landscape. Yeah. It's an interesting space, uh, working to hire people and grow these organizations. It's really fun. That's what I'm passionate about. I really love helping people find their right roles and really help love helping organizations find the right talent they need to grow. And that's what we're all about here at Talent Sync. So thank you again for having me on the show today. Hey, thank you. For everyone watching and listening, you just heard from Patrick Ganim, CEO and founder of Talent Sync. Check them out online. Uh, their web address is talentsyncltd.com. And as I mentioned earlier in the show, Patrick is also very involved on LinkedIn. Um, and another shout out to our friend, Zach Brown, who sent you to us. So really glad to have you here. You're doing some great work, Patrick. So thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. And before we sign off, another shout out of gratitude to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, that had this kooky idea in March of 2020 to build out the nonprofit show and to invite me to serve along as a co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd, as I push up my nerd glasses, a CEO of the Raven Group. And as you can tell, I love nerding out with our um, I'm going to call you another nerd, Patrick, because you're yeah. in the work workspace nerd, but I love these conversations. They are so much fun to me and I continue to, to learn and educate myself. You know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't also for these amazing sponsors. So immense gratitude to our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, we are so very honored to have their investment and commitment to these conversations, because as I mentioned to you, Patrick, the landscape not only in the workforce and the talent acquisition, but overall is ever changing. So grateful to have your insights on this conversation. Thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, thank you so yeah. much for having me on the show today. I really appreciate it and um, have a great day. <laughs> yeah, well, as we sign off every episode and I'll say this for you as well, Patrick, and all of our listeners um, that are tuned in, we invite you to stay well, so you can do well. Thanks again, Patrick. And for everyone else, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great day.